Now, what we're going to talk about, it's kind of in a continuance of the judgment seat of Christ. We talked about that and that we're going to stand before God and give an account. Now, what I want to do is I want to walk through a few slides here, and this is in relation to the judgment seat. This is something as I dug on in, and, and again, I'm on my own search for myself. I'd love to say that I'm studying for y'all, but I'm not. I'm looking for me, and you're just getting the overflow of that. But I want us to read this verse on the screen, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Now, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to find out, at least in a general term, what the glory of God is. Now, we speak of it, but I'm questioning, do we really understand when we say the term glory to God, what are we saying? What does that mean? If we say, Father, I glorify you, what are we saying and what does that mean? And if we don't know what it means, are we really glorifying him with that statement if we don't know what it means? What does it mean to glorify God? So we're going to look at glory because it's directly related to the judgment seat of Christ. So let's go back now to our next slide. Let me pull this up. I'm going to read through these. What if God wanting to show his wrath and make his power known endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction that he might make known the riches of his glory. Apparently he wants it known. On the vessels of mercy, that's you and I, which he prepared beforehand for glory, that's you and I, even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Next slide, John 12, 27. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. For this very purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. What was Jesus saying? Glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it, his name, and will glorify it again. What does that mean? He glorified his name. What does that mean? He'll glorify it again. Next slide, John 17, 4. For I have glorified you on the earth. This is Jesus speaking. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had, past tense, with you before the world was. What is glory? What is it that he had with the Father? Next slide. Now, I brought up these words. This is the Hebrew word for glory, and then the Greek word for glory, which would be given, the, the Greek word would be written, obviously written in Greek because that was the language of the day for spreading the gospel, and that it would have communicated basically the Hebrew meaning. So the Hebrew word is kavod, and it means heavy. It literally means heavy, or when I say literally in, in the word, it means heavy. And this is, here's the meaning, and this is a general meaning, the consequential meaning, this is what kavod is, the consequential meaning of the opinion which one forms. It is to recognize honor, praise, invest with dignity, give anyone esteem or honor by elevating him into an honorable position. This is what glory is. This is what the Hebrew word is. Then the Greek word is doxa, and it's the same meaning. It's just the Greek attempt or version, that was the closest word they could find to communicate the Hebrew meaning. 
So again, it's the consequential meaning, meaning something happened that caused this opinion to form in you. It is to recognize, honor, praise, and invest with dignity. To give anyone esteem or honor by elevating him into an honorable position. Now, the word holy is kadosh. That's the Hebrew word. And it means to be separate from. The opposite of common. Different than. The epitome of unique. That's kadosh. And then the Greek word is hagios, and that's the alternative into the Greek, and it means consecrated, and the opposite of common, different than, and the epitome of unique. Now, that third line there, it says glory and holy are measurements of value terms. They're measurements of value terms. Now, I want to go back to me here for a second. Now, I read through a lot, and I'm not expecting us to hang on to all those verses. I just wanted us to say that Jesus said he glorified the Father here. And then the Father, and Jesus says to him, be glorified. And he said, and that, to, that his name would be glorified. And he said, I have glorified my name. I will glorify it again. Then Jesus ask for the glory that he had with the Father before he became flesh, before the earth was. So the question is, what is this glory? Now, as we read there, glory is to, because you have seen or you have experienced, you now have an elevated view of someone. But here's the question I want to ask. Before God created, because Jesus said, I want the glory that I had with you before the earth was. But before God created anything, before he even created the heavens, before he created angels, before he created the beings, the creatures that are flying around the heavens saying, holy, holy, holy was God when it was just him. And I'm not even attempting to explain what we call the Trinity, the, the Father, Son, and Spirit. But when it was just God, Father, Son, and Spirit, when it was just that, no, nothing created, was God glorious? Well, of course, we're going to say, yes, he was glorious because God is glorious. But glorious is a relative term. It's, a, it's an evaluation. In other words, I say you are unique. Well, unique doesn't mean anything if you are the only one. Holy. Holy means separate from. But if you're the only one, was God holy before he created anything or any being? Was he holy? Now, I would say yes, but I'm saying based on the words that are used in the Hebrew to define holy and glorious, they are terms of value in comparison to. In other words, God is holy, separated from all other. What about when there was no other? when there was nothing for him to be wholly separate from, before he created the heavens, before any angels, before any creatures, before any man, was he glorious? Was he holy? Well, I'm going to say yes, but I don't know how we would use the words that we have in Hebrew to define what he was. He, God God doesn't improve over time, and he doesn't change. So whatever he is now, he already was. But again, I'm wanting us to see these words in order to push us to a point. If you are God, and you are glorious, and you are holy, and you are unique, yet there is nothing or no one to appreciate 
your holiness. Like those creatures flying around the heavens, it says they never stop day or night saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Why are they saying that? Because he's holy. Boy, are, do they enjoy doing that? Apparently so. And apparently his holiness and his glory is so staggering that, that they live to do this. But what if you were glorious? I'm, I'm trying to think in God's shoes, so to speak. What if you were that glorious, that holy, and there's no one to acknowledge you are so holy, so glorious. There is none like you because there is nothing except you. Now I'm saying this because this is, is part of the reason when we go back to Genesis 1 where God said it is not good to be alone even if you're God because you are so extraordinary you are so beyond the beyonds yet there's no one to value you there's no one to honor you to it. No one to say, holy, holy, holy is God. There's no one. So what is holy? What is holy then? Now I'm saying this because God, when he created us, he wants us to love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Yes. But that's going to come through us valuing him. So hang on to this. I want us to go through. Let me look at the bottom of this slide. So glory and holy are measurements of value. They're comparative terms. Being glorious and holy, God, being glorious and holy to me, is measured out to me in the revelation I know of him through my walk with him. People don't value God simply because he's glorious, simply because he's God. They value God when God is able to make known his value. This is the reason for the life we live. God is saying, I didn't only create you, putting my image in you, which is the ability, if cultivated, to value me. Now, I'm going to say this term because I heard Susan say, uh, quote, a minister, and this was not the exact context of the, of the statement, but he, he, he said about us in comparison to God, we're cockroaches. So to try to, now we're not cockroaches, okay, but I'm saying a, a, a cockroach. Imagine you just as we are, and we're not even close to being as God is. Imagine if, if you were surrounded by cockroaches and you wanted to, you wanted them to value you. And you would say, this is, <laughs> this is beyond doing. This is an impossible task. How could I get a cockroach to value me? Even if like a parrot, a bird, I could train it to mimic the talk and say, glory, glory, glory. That would not mean they really value me. That would just mean I taught them the statement. And this is what I'm afraid of that we're doing in the church is we're getting in the pattern of saying glorious things about God, yet true glorifying of God, true 
saying holy is the Lord is only if you understand his value in comparison to. If he's separate from, then that means we pray, place a value on whatever it is he's separate from, and we've come to value him above and beyond that. We've come to realize God is not a man. That's a value statement. He's more than a man. He's more than. This is what holy is. He's more than. He's more than what? You name good and God is more good than good. Even what we, we realize about God, God is saying, I'm wanting you to experience me. I'm wanting you to value me because I want to be loved. I want to be honored. I want to be adored. I want it to be said of me, holy is our God. But not because you learn those terms by memorizing a song that you sing on Sunday, that those words mean nothing to you. They're just to memorize like a parrot. I want to hear from you and I want to see from you true value of me. This is what God is looking for. Now, and this is what Jesus gave him. Now, I'm hoping to get, we'll just see how far we get. So if I say the statement, I am a fast runner, not being a fast runner, they're not synonymous with each other. If I say I'm a fast runner, not being a fast runner, those are not synonyms. That statement is a synonym only if I really am a fast runner. So as it says in James, if you see a brother who's in need and you say, depart in peace and be warmed and filled, but you don't give him what he needs, he's saying, no, then you, you didn't do what you thought you did. And so I'm saying, are we saying, be glorified? And then say, well, what does that mean? I don't know. Well, how effective, I guess I'll say, are words we say to God about God that are true, but they have no meaning in us? Am I glorifying him? So the point of James is to be a doer. And this is what I want to kind of emphasize in the glory. Now, pulling this slide up, when I say I glorify you, God, is this glorifying him? When Jesus said, Father, I have glorified you, is Jesus saying, I made the statement in front of men. I glorify you, Father. And in my prayer closet, I glorify you, Father. Is that what Jesus meant when he said, I have glorified you? I don't think that's what he meant. When Jesus was saying, Father, I have glorified you, he was saying, I have expressed, revealed, and made known your value to men. Through the life I lived in the flesh, that did not impede your value or glory to man so that you could be seen, experienced, heard, and revealed. So I want to read this again. When Jesus was saying, Father, I've glorified you, he was saying, I have expressed, revealed, and made known your value. Example. When you've seen me, you've seen the Father. To men, through the life I lived, not simply the words I said, through the life I lived in the flesh, and the life I lived in the flesh did not impede your value or glory to man, to be seen, to be experienced, to be heard, and to be revealed. 
God is passionately expecting to be personally valued and thus loved by every son of God. And this is 1 Peter 1, 6 through 8, 1 Corinthians 3, 9 through 15. I have those slides to follow, but I want to comment on this a couple of minutes here. What God, and, and this goes, I had to weed out a ton of verses again because I tend to put too many and then we lose the, the message for the sake of all of the different applications. But when Jesus was saying, Father, I glorified you, what was he saying? He's saying, Father, you are invisible. No one has seen your image but the only Son. No one, ever. Moses didn't see it. No one, ever. No one ever has seen you. You are the invisible, omniscient, omnipotent creator. But I came to reveal you, not myself to reveal you. I lived the life that allowed you to do what you wanted to do, to say what you wanted to say, to reveal yourself, your compassion. When it says Jesus was moved with compassion. Now, I am not saying Jesus personally was not moved with compassion because he was, his will was being formed into the will of the Father. But it was the life lived that allowed the will of the Father to be formed into him. Because remember, the final act of the forming of the will of the Father into the Son was when the Son said, it is not my will to go to the cross, but it is your will. And therefore... I submit my will to your will. Your will be done. And he went to the cross. So Jesus was saying the life I lived was a constant, not just as we say it or see it. We kind of say, okay, Lord, I need to know what the will of God is today so that I have success in who I pray for or what ministry I do or whatever I do. I'm looking for the will of God so that I may be prosperous. But Jesus was not looking for the will of God that he may be prosperous. Jesus was looking for the will of God so that he revealed the invisible God so that the invisible God could be known and valued by human beings created in his image and likeness. See, we have the capability, if we can see the invisible God, we have the capability of truly valuing him. Not like me trying to get a cockroach to value me. We can truly value God, but not just by hearing, God is good, God is great, God can do miracles. Oh, I value him. You and I know that's not enough. That's not enough. We can't just simply hear. Now, when I say hear, we definitely, definitely need to hear. But the words that are spoken that impart the invisible God to people are words that come from someone who values him. See, Jesus, when he said, I came to reveal the Father, to speak for the Father, to act for the Father, to do all that I do on behalf of the Father so that you may know him. And then when his disciples said, oh, Jesus, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. Show us the Father? Do you not understand that when you've seen me, you're seeing the invisible father through my life. And the more that life caves in on me in the flesh, and the more that I continue in his will, the more I'm being transformed myself. And it's the same with us. God is saying, don't, and, and, and listen, I'm responsible as much as anybody that I know by misunderstanding the purpose of the disciplined life, the, the keeping your flesh under, 
the separating your lifestyle, the diligence that it takes to live a godly life, the practice of godliness. I was doing that because it's the thing to do. It's the right thing to do. The Word of God says do it. And that's true. But that is a very, very low understanding of why. Because what we're going to see is the reason why is as we live the life God wants us to live, which is in the pattern of his son who was raised in the highest glory a human being will ever be raised in. See, the image of Jesus for us, now we're never going to be him. So I want to make sure that's clear. We're never going to be him. We're never going to be, even though it says we're seated in heavenly places with him, all authority in heaven and earth has not been given to me. Okay, it's not been given to you. We're not there. It's enough to be like him. That's what the word of God says. But this is what we want to be like because Jesus was the perfect reflection of the Father. People were able to know the true and living God through Jesus. Now, he's unique. He's unique in above and beyond us in every way. Jesus is, both in his humanity and in his deity, he's beyond us. I'm not even pushing towards that elevation to that degree. But there is a place man can go in him to where the Father can be glorified in us. And it's not through simply parroting the words, I glorify you, God. Be glorified. Now, are you saying, Donnie, those words shouldn't be said? Oh, no. They should be said, but they should be said because we understand his value. That we're saying, folks, glorify God. He is so beyond. He is so good. He is so gracious. He is so beyond the beyonds that he could take the likes of us and even desire a relationship with us. And not only that, that he's able to bring us into a place where we can value the omniscient, omnipotent creator. This is what Jesus was saying is, Father, I have glorified you. Jesus went revealing the Father. Jesus went showing, demonstrating, and living a life to where the Father's glory could be manifest in the healing of sickness and disease and deliverance and salvation and the telling of the kingdom that's to come all of this was to the glory of God the Father. And this is what Jesus was saying. Father, I've glorified you. I have, I have spoken in an exalted way. I have revealed your extraordinariness. I have not hindered the revelation of you in any way. I lived the life that reflected the invisible God to the sons of men, sons of God, people with the image of God on the inside of them. Why? Because when I revealed you, when I reveal your greatness, your extraordinariness, when I reveal, they are able to perceive because they're creating your image and likeness. The only beings that can reflect that type of the glory of God is God and human beings because we're created in the image and likeness of God. We are in small what he is in big. And this, this is what the judgment seat is all about. The judgment seat is not about how big you can get your mansion to be, whether you can get extra rooms, whether you're going to have extra whatevers and whatevers, or a pile of gold in the backyard. It's going to be about one thing. The glory of God 
that you are allowed to steward. When that guy was given five cities to be ruler over, he was going to be allowed to steward the glory of God, doing the will of God, revealing the greatness of God over five cities versus two cities versus one city. Why? Because he was a faithful steward of the glory of God. God wants to be valued. God wants us to be in awe, not say we're in awe when we don't even know what we're talking about. And you say, well, I, I, I don't know what I don't know. That's right. None of us know when we start on this journey. As I've said, when I came to know the Lord, it was all about going to heaven and missing hell. I wasn't even as excited about going to heaven as I was missing hell. Well, that's good, but that's a child's gospel. That's an infant's gospel. But the true gospel is, I can know the invisible, omniscient, omnipotent creator and truly value him, truly grasp, not all, but I can truly grasp to the degree that I'm willing to be transformed. His true value, his true worth, his true extraordinariness. I can value this. I can, and, and listen, I'm not talking about just simply saying, although we should say, because God is worthy of the, the accolades that we say about him, whether we understand them or not, but God knows if he's hearing parrot talk or if there's someone out there who's saying, God, I have come to see there is none like you. There is none like you. To what can you be compared? Who, who is like our God? Who, who or what could we compare him to? God knows when we know. That doesn't mean we know everything about him. We're never going to know everything about him. I'm just wanting to know what I can know. But this can know is what comes through the crucible of this life, of losing this life to gain that life. But what is that life? Oh, it's getting to go to heaven. It's not getting to go to heaven. And thank you, Jesus. As, as I said, I'd rather be in heaven than hell, even if I got in and absolutely everything I ever did or thought in my whole life burns up into ashes and I get in as by fire. Praise the Lord, I'd rather have that than, than not make it. But God forbid that I could actually realize the greatness of the invisible God, the greatness of his son, to realize his extraordinariness, to be in awe, to genuinely say, there is none like him. None. There is none like him. This is what God is looking for. I mean, we can't even imagine. We can't imagine being as extraordinarily above and beyond and yet saying, at such a great cost, I paid the price because I want to be valued, honored, exalted, extolled. I want to be loved. I want to be worshiped, not because people are afraid I'll kick them out of heaven if they don't, but because they truly have come to value me. They truly see he is good. He is just, he is righteous, he is holy, he is glorious. There is no one like him. This is what God wants. 
But you can't just wake up and say this. I mean, you can say it, (laughs) amen. And I'm not going to say it's wrong to say it. If you don't mean it, But if he is all of those things that I just said, and he is and more, is there a way I can know? See, Moses said in Exodus, if I have found favor in your sight, show me your glory. Moses was not simply saying, Show off to me. Do something. Do a trick. Do something extraordinary. Stagger me. He was saying, no, I'm not looking for a trick. I'm not looking for a demonstration of power. I'm looking for your value. What you say is most valuable about yourself. Reveal to me what is greatest value and glory. Show me your glory. But at that time, the father said, "Mm, can't. For no man can see my face, which reveals my glory and live. But I will show you my backside. And then he proclaimed about himself that he's gracious, merciful, forgives iniquities, transgressions, and sins. And God says, this is part of my glory. This is part of my extraordinariness that I made you and breathed my image into you and was willing to live through and go through what was necessary to raise up beings who could value me and me value them, love me and me love them. But he said, even that is not my face. Even that is not all my glory, but you can't handle it. And so Moses was satisfied as are we with the backside of his glory at this point. But God wants to be valued. This is what Jesus was saying. Father, I I showed your value to men. I spoke of your value to men. I lived your value to men. I did all I could do to get men to value you through me. I did all that I could do. I obeyed you to make you known, your greatness known, your mercy known, your compassion known. I did all of this to make you known so that men would value you, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus. And Jesus said concerning the Father, he is greater than I. Yet Jesus is the revelation of the Father. So there's more beyond. The question is, Lord, show us your glory. Oh, now we go back to being transformed into the image of my son. My son lived as a man. Took on the likeness of sinful flesh. Humbled himself into the likeness of sinful flesh. But he was raised in glory. He is your pattern. You want to know how to do it? Follow in his footsteps. Become a disciple of Jesus. Do what he did. Live a life that does not impede my ability to reveal myself through you. I want to read these two verses in light of this. 1 Peter 1, 6. In this you greatly rejoice, and now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, this is us, 
being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire. I call this the testing by fire before death up there at the top. Though it is tested by fire that you may be found to praise, honor, and glory that you may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you have loved. Then the second verse, 1 Corinthians 3, this is the fire after death, tested by fire after death. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. What will be revealed by fire? And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it was. If anyone's work which he has done endures, he will receive reward. But if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved. Now I want to read one more verse. This one I don't have in the uh, computer. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. Paul writing to us. But we, we speak a wisdom of God in a mystery. There's our mysterion. A hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But notice back up here in verse 7, that God ordained before the ages for our glory. What is our glory? Our glory is the degree to which we have come to value God. And to use a figure of speech, it oozes out of us that God's glory is reflected in our lives. See, God has prepared for us glory. He prepared this before the ages. It's not about your mansion. It's not even about ruler of five cities. It's about being a ruler of five cities because of the glory to which you have been able to steward by being conformed to the image of his son. And that God says, there, there's one of my glorious ones. Because he came to value me. And he reflects me. He, he, because he pursued the image of my son, who came to reveal me. This is what we're running for, folks. Listen, Jesus atoned for us and bought us. Thank you, Jesus. And now God says, I created you and designed you to be conformed to the image of my son, the perfect man who reflected all of my glory in the life that he lived. And now I'm saying to you, become his disciple. Become as he is. Become what he, how he would live your life if he was living it for you. Live that way. When you do, you're going to reveal me. You're going to glorify me. You're going to speak highly of me because you believe it. Not because, well, I feel like I need to say something biblical, so let me say something. Glory to God. No, but because you have come to see God is glorious. He is great. He's extraordinary. He's beyond. And he says, this is what I'm looking for. And that day will reveal it. A lot of people are going to have a lot of expect expectations when they get to heaven. God is looking for one. His glory reflected in us. His glory that he was able to work in us. 
to join in to us by becoming great to us. But how do we, how do we get God to be great to us? Doing and living the life Jesus lived. Jesus increased in his glory in this life. But he then asked, I want the glory back that I had with you before the world was. See, Jesus lowered himself in order to give us a pattern that we can follow and walk in the greatest glory of our lives, the glory of God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come to you, and Lord, I thank you for helping us to understand, to grasp. Holy Spirit, I am asking you, reveal to us the path to walk that we may begin to perceive, to receive, to, to have, to acquire. to the understanding and the knowledge of God, as Paul said, that I might know him. Not just his Savior, but know him for who he is, what he is, that I may know and know and know. And Lord, we worship you. And we thank you that you want to be known. You want to reveal yourself. You want to be mighty to us. You want to be extraordinary to us. You want us to see and to understand and to grasp. And now we're saying, Lord, we want to see. We want to understand. We want to grasp. We want to reflect your glory. We want to glorify you. We want to be able to say what Jesus said. Father, I have glorified you in my life. And Lord, we thank you for this, that you would share such a revelation of yourself to us that we can know the omniscient, omnipotent, the beyond the beyonds, the unknowable, invisible God, yet we can know you and we can be like Moses as having seen him who is invisible because the word became flesh and has become the place, the very temple through which we can come to know the extraordinary, the beyond, the holy, the holy, the holy one. We can know you. We can actually perceive your greatness and your glory. Lord, we ask you, be glorified, be glorified, be glorified in our lives, in our speech, in our thoughts, in our minds, be glorified. And Lord, may we reflect and exalt and lift up the glory of God, all that we can grasp. And we thank you for this in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Your mercy. What? Oh. Your mercy is so beyond. Lord, we love you. We worship you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.